and welcome to our talk, What We Left Behind, Forgotten Lessons from the 1990s. I'm Garth and uh, this is Eamon. Uh, so a little bit about myself. I was a full-time software developer for about six years and then the option came up to give training a go and I thought, what the hell, I'll try it, probably only last six months. And that was about 15 years ago. So back of an envelope, I've done over a thousand deliveries and uh, a bunch of coaching, mentoring, all that kind of stuff. So, um, Eamon, do you want to say a few things about yourself? Yep. I haven't been uh, training as long as Garth. I've been doing this for about three and a half years. Prior to that, about 15 years uh, development and architect experience. So I've done about 200 deliveries or so in the last number of years. Very good. Excellent. Yep. I got Eamon. A wave. Oh. 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 That was a close one. That was a close one. Because we're clearly it? definitely on a boat. We, we are on a boat. Yeah. Yes. So we are on a boat in Copenhagen and we are definitely not at Instill. No. Yeah. If we were at Instill, it would be a software development company based out of Belfast. Uh, Our office yes. actually looks a little bit like this cabin. It does actually, yes. It's okay. very, very strange, yes. Uh, where we, we build software, we teach training courses, we do coaching, mentoring, all that kind of stuff. So uh, you can find us online at instill.co. And uh, here are a few shots from the office where we are definitely not right now and some of the people that we work for. So what this talk is about is it's about a 20 year gap in your understanding and we all have this. So there are the things that you learn from your own personal experience and then there are the things that you're taught about as history and in between those two there's a 20 year gap and we all have it but of course for each of us it covers a slightly different period in history. Yeah. So Eamon and myself are both grumpy and old aren't we? Yeah, you're grumpier. Yes. And older. And older, yes. Quite but well. I'm greyer. Exactly, yes. So uh, our 20 year gap is probably further back than yours is. You know what, we remember things that you don't. And uh, that's why whenever young, innocent developers get all excited about some technology, you know, and then go tell the, the grumpy old developers about it, we all go, nah, you know, because uh, it's not in our dead zone. You know, we remember this the, uh, the last time it came around. And uh, it's made even worse in IT because in computer science, we ignore our own history. So if you ask the average developer to describe the, the history of the IT industry, well, they'll say, of course, you have uh, Lovelace and Babbage. Yeah. And then later that week, Turing came along. And by the end of the summer, Twitter, Facebook, Amazon, anything you can possibly want. You know? So uh, as an industry, we're very bad at understanding and documenting our own history. And that means that the, the same things just come around time after time and we fail to learn from our mistakes. So uh, uh, again, if you talk to the average developer, well, they'll say that in the 1990s, we were all idiots. Isn't that right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And then uh, they invented Agile and it's been all plain sailing since then. Yeah. So uh, we would beg to differ. We would say it's a little bit more complicated than that. So uh, let's just talk about what it was like in the 1990s. Well, it was a crazy time. Uh, we were all obsessed with machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, we were having debates about static and dynamic typing and which was better. Uh, nobody really knew how to do estimation and we argued about that. Uh, people were interested in functional programming. And of course, back then we were making fun of JavaScript developers. And uh, these are some of the TV shows and movies that were on screen at the time. So of course, these days, it's completely different, isn't it, Eamon? Totally different. Totally different, everything has changed. Um, we uh, were obsessed with machine learning and AI, we're having arguments about static and dynamic typing, we don't know how to estimate use cases and features, uh, we're all fascinated by functional programming and we're making fun of JavaScript developers. So it's, it's a whole new world, you know. Totally so, different. Yeah. How can we learn any lessons from the 90s? So yeah, so uh, in the 90s we did have some really stupid ideas and one of these silly ideas was that the network was the computer. So there would be these uh, independent components that we would write and deploy. Some of them we would be deploy ourselves, others would have been pre-deployed for us, and we would wire these together to create complicated applications. So the average developer, they would just be writing glue code and uh, creating big long configuration files, you know, with lots of opportunities for typos and confusion and so on. I mean, we're never going to do yeah. that again. I thought we're not going to make that mistake. Either. No, no, no. Oh. Absolutely not. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> moving on, moving on. Yeah. So uh, uh, another thing worth bearing in mind is that there's been very new, few new ideas in the history of computing. So uh, a nice quote here from our friend Dom Davis, it is my conjecture that there has been nothing new in computing since the 1970s with the one exception of AI which was 1984, okay? So everything else is just relearning what we knew already, you know? And uh, you can see this out there from, uh, from tweets like this. 
So uh, in preparing this talk, uh, we went out and uh, talked to a whole bunch of uh, colleagues. So some of these are friends we've known for 20 years, other people we just know through online debates. But uh, these are examples of the people that we went out and source quotes from. And uh, there was a bunch of other people as well who preferred to remain anonymous. But uh, what we're going to do in the talk is we're going to try and give you 10 lessons from the 90s, okay? So uh, our friend James Bunch, he wins the, uh, the award for nailing all the themes. You know, he found almost all the themes that we're going to talk about. And we should say that this is not every developer. This is just some of the places where we've seen that people have forgotten the lessons. Nobody at this conference mm. has for, could learn anything from this talk. Nope. This is only for nope. the bad developers, the other people. Yes, yes. Th this is for you to take away for the other developers at your companies who aren't doing things right. You know, so you you go out there and try and educate them. We know you're all brilliant. Yep. Absolutely, excellent. So we're going to do this turnaround. Um, so I'll start first, if that's okay, Eamon. Yep. Excellent. So I'll kick off with number one. Uh, draw more pictures. Okay. So uh, back in the nineties, we drew an awful lot of software engineering diagrams. Yeah. And then unfortunately, the uh, the UML came along and ruined it. Yeah. So uh, there was an obsession with this thing called executable UML, which we'll we'll mention in a minute. But worth saying, diagrams are great. I love diagrams. Yeah, especially state charts. So uh, sadly, in this recorded format, I can't ask, but I'd love to know how many of you are drawing state charts at the moment. State charts are my favorite kind of diagram. So whether you're doing OO or functional or whatever, they're great. You know? So these days, we just don't draw enough diagrams. Um, there are a few exceptions. So for those of you who are into your reactive programming, you may draw marble diagrams of reactive streams, stuff like that. Uh, but mostly, we don't draw software engineering diagrams diagrams anymore. Yeah. And uh, a great quote here from our friend David Kennedy to explain why. So UML was a good idea, he'll fight you over it. Uh, turning it into a cargo cult of detail was a bad idea. Uh, the people who write wiki articles about the different types of shoes in each Star Trek film, well they got hold of it and they ruined it through over elaboration. So what we mean by that is that you can draw any software engineering diagram at one of three levels of detail. So you've got an analysis level diagram, and that's kind of a sketch, you know, that shows you what you intend to do. And then you've got the design level diagram, and that's not at the level of code, but it's not far away. It's the thing that you look at before you go and you write the code. And then you've got a blueprint, you know, so a blueprint is a diagram that shows you how the, uh, how the code actually works. And the trouble, it, the trouble is that tool vendors dragged us to that third one. So they, uh, the tool vendors got us obsessed with buying tools that would draw diagrams in so much detail that you could push, push, push a magic button and the code would just drop out. Yeah? But uh, sadly, that wasn't true. But that just spoiled the UML for everybody and it put a bad taste in people's mouths that persists to this day. Now, that doesn't mean that people aren't drawing diagrams. So uh, we go to a lot of conferences and uh, we recently helped organize serverless days in Belfast and uh, everybody's presentations had a ton of diagrams. Yeah? But A, there was no standardization and B, they'd obviously got help from quality graphic designers, which is great, <laughs> you know? but we can't all do that. You know, wouldn't it be better if there was a proper standard that we could all use for cloud engineering diagrams and embedded systems diagrams and functional and OO diagrams and so on. So what we're saying is that we suffer really badly from A, not drawing enough diagrams, and B, there not being enough standardization. So shout out to Simon Brown and the C4 model, who's one of the few people who's doing absolutely amazing work in this area, you know, but we need a lot more people doing what he's doing at the minute. So uh, what's the lesson? What do we think we can learn from the 90s? Well, get into the habit of drawing more diagrams of architecture. And then uh, we need to define different notations for different domains, the domains that are current at the moment, mobile, serverless, all that kind of thing. And uh, we need a new generation of modeling tools that work well, probably work online, and don't cost the earth. And we need to learn to differentiate between the different levels of abstraction. So developers tend to worry that whenever they draw an analysis diagram, it's not in enough detail, but we have to realize that that's fine. You know, if you're drawing the diagram at the right level of detail, then you're doing the job right. So that's number one. Eamon, do you want to do number two? Yep, thanks very much. This one sort of follows on a, a little bit from that. So this is thinking about critiquing your own design. So uh, 
what we've seen with the, the reduction in the number of diagrams is people have not are not investing as much in design in general um, you know back in the early 2000s and sort of late 90s uh, architecture was sort of commoditized with things like uh, JE and, and other frameworks like that where the idea was that we could just simply bolt a couple of things together and, and end up with a coherent uh, sensible architecture and that's really not the case and we're seeing fewer people actually devoting the time to doing this design it's sort of seen um, like a dirty word with some of the agile movements now it's not to say that people aren't doing it like all of these arguments and um, but we're definitely seeing a, a reduction in it you know um, so uh, what we sort of find is that people have switched the review process to being um, like bike shedding, just nitpicking syntax. So what we're seeing is some good quotes here from people. We've got Jamie Allen here saying, very little design or forethought goes into many systems. And then to make matters worse, uh, testing isn't being done because engineers aren't being incentivized to do so. Um, and this is sort of a, a big problem in our industry. that We actually have to try and re-emphasize the importance of doing these things these designs and doing these design reviews okay not just doing the nitpicking of, of syntax peer review here's another one uh, from Einar he's saying my impression is that we somehow managed to simultaneously under model and over engineer because we're not thinking about it we're just pulling in these big components plunking them together and hoping that at the end we'll end up with something good uh, but it's really going to be uh, just a mess so we, the, uh, John Nolan here has got a great uh, summary of this. We never said that architecture was bad, but because it was associated with big think up front or big design up front, it got besmirched uh, and it was being of the same evil. So it's a bit like we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater uh, with this one. Here's another one uh, from uh, Martin Thompson. Doing a sensible amount uh, of upfront design got rejected with a misunderstanding of agile and dogma taking over. So uh, this is again, I mean, agile has this concept of just enough, just enough uh, documentation, just enough design, just enough diagrams uh, to basically make better products and make sure that we know how our systems are working. Because as we're building bigger and bigger systems, we have to have this understanding. So the summary here, the takeaways, uh, try to make design reviews part of your process, not just uh, syntax peer reviews on GitHub and things like that. Uh, run your code and make sure that it's actually working. I oftentimes see people doing reviews and they're not actually running up uh, the system. Uh, look out for and promote patterns as human beings. We're really, really good at pattern recognition so we don't get eaten by lions and things like that. Uh, you know, watch out for patterns. They're good to make it uh, easy to rapidly understand the system, but also spot errors when things are deviating from the pattern. Uh, and then coming up with these documentation patterns similar to diagram patterns. Uh, and just step back from the syntax and actually think about your system, think about your design, think about your algorithms more. Cool, very good, excellent. So uh, back to me for number three. So uh, read and write. So again, uh, we'd love to know how many of you have read uh, Neuromancer. So uh, inside Neuromancer, there's a prediction that uh, being literate and being a programmer would just part ways, okay? So they'd go off in other directions. So uh, eventually you get, could get coders, who, hackers, who are incredibly good at their job, but as it says there in the quote from the book, are barely print literate, you know? So that was the projection. And uh, sadly, it's increasingly becoming true, okay? So uh, you see a lot more tweets like this on the internet now, you know, so uh, is it really documentation if you can understand it without a, a YouTube video and a whole bunch of blog posts? So we've got acclimatized to uh, seeing really bad documentation and thereby uh, we kind of think that we can get away with writing bad documentation as well. So developers have got into this hideous negative loop where we think that you can't just open up the documentation and read it. Uh, you've got to go to Stack Overflow, should say, as humble trainers, we use this website called Stack Overflow, where yeah, people can post questions now that they, they wouldn't have heard of it, you know, but uh, you know, if you're having a bad day, you might find it quite useful, you know. So uh, de developers go out to things like Medium, uh, they can go out to Stack Overflow and so on, but the documentation is no longer their first port of call. So as I say, uh, they seem to have got into this negative feedback pattern where we as developers see per documentation so uh, we expect that we'll have to go out to find people's blog posts maybe they're good maybe they're bad 
that, you know, but we gather information from these blog posts, um, from Stack Overflow questions, we do personal research of our own and so on. And uh, we end up with learned avoidance, you know, what we learn that you just don't go to the documentation as your first uh, port of call, you Google and then you go to, uh, to Medium. So this is not a good thing, yeah? So uh, again, a nice quote here from Martin Thompson, uh, documentation skills got lost as agile got people thinking code is all you need. And again, we're not slagging off agile here, we're slagging off some of the myths that came off agile. And uh, one of the myths that came off agile was that you didn't need to write documentation, uh, you didn't need to be good at writing documentation and so on. So uh, we think this is a serious uh, issue. Uh, we think all developers should go, I mean, we go on courses to, to learn how to become better technical writers and so on. Uh, we think it should be a core skill of every developer. And our, our CEO wrote a little blog post on this, which uh, we would recommend. So what we would say uh, to developers today, well, break the cycle of badly written documentation. Yeah, spend more time on your docs and less time writing, you know, semi-angry, passive-aggressive posts on uh, Medium and answering questions on Stack Overflow. Not that those are bad things in themselves, but, you know, less time on those, more time on the documentation. Yeah, and uh, go in training courses, read books, read articles about how to be uh, a technical author. Uh, time spent on that will be rewarded and then find some way to integrate documentation with example code. So for many modern languages, there's now a way where you can have runnable code embedded with the documentation. So people can read a paragraph and then look at some code and run, a file, run it and modify it within a REPL. And I think that's great. Cool. Cool, yep. Uh, so the fourth one is invented here. And this might sound similar to something that you've maybe heard before. Um, so in the 90s, uh, software companies used to write a lot of their own libraries and their own tools. Um, I remember working for a company and within the company, within different teams within the same company, they had their own uh, data structures, their own operating system uh, constructs like uh, mutexes and semaphores, but this is within the one company. Um, so we definitely took it too far uh, in this era, uh, which is where we've uh, described this as the not invented here syndrome. That's definitely uh, something that we, we uh, made a mistake in. Uh, even Linus Torvalds here, he's saying the not invented here syndrome is a disease. So we took it too far, but we've swung the other way now. We've gone to the other extreme, and now we're really afraid uh, to, to use our own code at all. We're constantly going to a uh, library-based solution for anything. Oh, I, I need to concatenate two strings together. Let's see what JavaScript libraries out there will do that for me. And we're not really thinking about the cost of this. We sort of find now in projects, and it's, it's, it's not only the front end, I think the front end uh, probably does this a little bit worse, but in the front end and the back end, we typically don't know what our dependencies are. We have these huge dependency trees and we we don't we just don't know what's in there. We don't know uh, you know if they're if they're buggy, if they're gonna be supported, um, or to a more extreme if they're nefarious, if they're actually gonna send our Bitcoin credentials off. Uh, and these sorts of things are happening out there. So uh, we're sort of just crossing our fingers and hoping we need to sort of try and rein this in and get a little bit more control. So as I say, front end gets a bit of a bad rap here. Because um, there are never any errors in back end. No, 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 no. Back, back end developers rock. Yeah. Rock we, we, do, we don't make mistakes. Yeah, yeah and, the, and the stuff is always really clearly understood. Yep. But I, I mean, I actually like React, but I'm picking on React here. So here we're creating a React project. Um, and this is like, hello world, I haven't written any business logic here. Uh, I'm getting some sort of output, some errors, some probably, probably nah. fine, probably fine. Nah, it's just uh, let's see how many dependencies we have. We have 1,190 dependencies. That's before I've written a line of code. So it just sort of feels that when we're doing these NPM and yarn installs, that we're just dumping all this stuff in and we're just assuming it works because, well, enough people use React, so it's probably not a problem. Uh, here's another sort of summary of this from module counts. So the yellow line there is Java, uh, you know, and I hear one or two people use Java. I hear Here, they do. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, but you can see that JavaScript isn't seeing npm. Where we've got one million uh, two hundred thousand modules. I'm sure it's all really, 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 really good code. You know. So uh, this is a, I love this quote from Jeff Taylor. He's saying packaging in C was hard, <coughs> but it did make you intensely aware of your dependencies. Now, from coming from a background of C and C plus plus. I do not want to go back there. Do, You're do, not do, going do, to make do, me go do, back do, there. Do, do, do. I'm not going back there, okay? <laughs> I don't want to deal with the let's, way that... Let's leave the header files in the 90s. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm not going back. But this is very true that, you know, you did have to really think about all of your moving parts, all of your dependencies. 
Um, so there's maybe like something where we can learn a little from this. Not go back, nope. but maybe learn a little bit from this. So what's the, the lesson here? Try to take control of your dependencies, think about your dependencies, and really think about that cost benefit. You know, if it's if you can write it in one line of code that you own, maybe that's better. Um, you know, there's a time that it takes to learn a library, to teach other people in your team the library. Is the library going to support it? Does it have bugs? There is a cost there. So just evaluate, make sure that you're getting a lot of value from what you're getting. Now React is doing something massive, so that's worth, but Stop going for these like one line solutions going towards libraries and try to understand your dependencies. Absolutely. Yep. Very good. Next one, uh, learn to test. So uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the hashtag uh, Kevlin Henny, where uh, they put up uh, bugs that have been observed in the wild, uh, usually at airports. So here's one of my favorites where something's obviously gone wrong and they've vomited all the details of the build. You know, I, I like to imagine it scrolls on a little bit and gives the home address of the senior developer and so on. So uh, as software developers, uh, we keep making mistakes, a couple of prominent ones here from, uh, from the news. Yeah. And uh, you might say, hold on, but you know, didn't Agile instill respect for testing? You know, well, yes, Agile made us test infected at the level of unit testing, you know, at the level of TDD, at the level of automated testing. But uh, there's a lot more to testing than that. So uh, here's a, a very famous diagram of the different testing quadrants. And uh, if you're familiar with how testing has grown and uh, evolved and matured as a pr profession uh, ever since the 90s, they've done an awful lot of work. You know, so we as developers, we live in the, the bottom left quadrant here. And then uh, if you go to the top left, well then that's where we're still doing automated tests but it's more business facing so that's where your BDD and so on lives and then if you go to the top right well then there's the testing that you can't do because it's the test you didn't think to write yeah so that's where you get professional testers testing your UI or you're bringing real-world customers into the uh, the room and letting them have a crack at the UI and so on and then finally in the bottom right is where you're doing the ility testing you know so you're testing the performance the scalability the reliability Ability, all that kind of thing. So if you show this graph to developers, uh, they tend to go like this, you know? So uh, you go into quadrant two and they go, eh, that's, that's a cucumber stuff, isn't it? You know? And then uh, you talk about exploratory testing and they go, what? You know? And then uh, you mention performance and security and so on. It's like, me. well, that's what we do in the last week of the project if we have the time, okay? So uh, Agile instilled uh, a huge respect in us developers for testing, but only in the, uh, the bottom left quadrant. Yeah. So uh, back in the day, we understood the job of a professional tester a lot more and we relied on them an awful lot more and possibly we appreciated QA staff a bit more as well. So uh, if you're interested in seeing what the testers are getting up to these days, uh, the Ministry of Testing is an absolutely wonderful site and they publish uh, all kinds of blogs and articles for professional testers, which is very good. Yeah. So what are we saying? Well, we're saying that developers today could have more respect for the testers rule. Yeah. They could understand more the whole scope of testing. So not just the unit testing stuff, not just the stuff that can be automated. That's maybe just 40% of it. There's a lot more than that, you know? So realize that not all testing can be automated and especially take the non-functional testing seriously, especially these days, the security and the performance. Cool. Uh, so number six, uh, master the tools. And again, you know, some people are very good at this, but with the amount of training that we do, we see a lot of people um, that are suffering from not really understanding how to leverage the, the wealth of things that we have available to us uh, today. So what I'm talking about here is really like optimizing your workflow. So back in the day, uh, you know, working in C and C++, um, things took a lot longer, uh, you know, so I, I would do like an incremental change and that could take uh, half an hour. Uh, a full build of everything, including all of our dependencies, could take 24 hours. Uh, and when things took longer, when compilers took longer, machines were slower, you learned how to streamline, you learned how to keep things moving whenever things were taking this long. So you learned how to use keyboard shortcuts, you, you knew how to automate things, you knew how to write macros, uh, you knew how to multitask so that you could prioritize things, uh, so that things could keep moving in this sort of slower environment. And what we're seeing is, it's not everybody, but we're seeing that some people aren't really leveraging what we have available today. The machines that we have now today are so, so powerful. The tools are so good. There's so many good paid for and free tools out there that you really want to be able to make sure that you're leveraging these and maximizing the benefits that we have. Uh, I've seen people who are totally afraid uh, to use the terminals. 
Um, you know, they've, they've, they've finished a degree and, and they've never been able to, they've never used the term, I've never used it in anger. I've seen them, you know, ne their hands are never leaving the mouse. Um, so like even in the extreme of like right clicking to copy, right clicking to paste and you know i think we can do better than this the tools today can do so much heavy lifting so much refactoring navigation insights into your code debugging and um, we really want to make sure that we can sort of leverage these and maximize these so this is a uh, vim vim is about 30 years old uh, and it's you know it's a clone of vi which is over 40 years old uh, but this is still around today why is that you know, you will see in VS Code, in Visual Studio, in IntelliJ, WebStorm, all of these tools have plugins which give you a, a Vim experience inside the IDE. Why is this? It's because people who are, can use these tools are really, really productive. I know just enough to be dangerous, but it is a skill that every developer should be able to use um, this sort of tool, uh, uh, at least basically, because in these sort of remote distributed worlds we live in today, it may be the only interface that you have as well. So it's good just to be able to use this, but it's also good thinking about, you know, what made this tool so good? Uh, it's the productivity once you learn to master it. It's hard to master. It is hard to master, but it's worth that investment, okay? Uh, this is something I, I would always do with the developers when they join my team. Uh, I would take like a cheat sheet of the ID. So here we have IntelliJ. Take the cheat sheet and I would just take a highlighter and uh, highlight uh, the ones that I knew off the top of my head. Now I just do it with PDFs or Perceive and Trees. Uh, but you can see that in the, even in this single A4 cheat sheet, it's not a lot of shortcuts, but these are the ones that I just know muscle memory off the top of my head because they're that useful. It's like copy and paste, Control and C, Control and V, cut, Control and X. But then what about move code, read name uh, methods, move methods, inline things? All of these sort of shortcuts can make you more productive and we need to sort of make sure that people are uh, becoming masters of the tools like, like the same way that the tradesman would be. So what are we trying to say? What's the lessons here? Learn keyboard shortcuts. Uh, learn your IDE. I don't care what IDE it is. I, I'm not going to promote one or another, but whichever one it is, try to be, you know, know every inch of that tool uh, and understand where it can help you. So you can spend more of your time thinking about the design, more of your time problem solving, uh, not just doing mechanical typing and operations, not doing busy work. Be comfortable with the terminal. The terminal is ubiquitous. The terminal allows us to easily create uh, repeatable steps that are easy to describe, easy to repeat. Um, just try to be generally lazy. Try to automate all that boring stuff uh, so that you can do uh, more important work. Yeah. Cool, excellent, very good. So next one, uh, focus on fundamentals. So as we said way back at the start, um, Eamon and I teach a lot. <laughs> so uh, uh, I in particular have done over a thousand deliveries at this stage, which is a, a little bit scary. So um, as time goes on, of course, you notice trends. Yeah. So there are things that we see people asking for less. Yeah. So back in the day, uh, everybody was very keen on knowing about how to maximize and measure the performance of their applications. Um, there was a lot of interest in how data structures actually worked. Maybe not how to write them from scratch, but how they actually worked, what the underlying algorithm algorithms were, how to use them properly and so on. Uh, people were interested in adopting alternative collection libraries, especially in Java, ones optimized for performance and so on. Uh, people wanted to know how the compiler applied different levels of optimization, how garbage collection worked, all that kind of thing. And uh, we were giving out a lot of low level detail on network protocols, threading APIs, all that kind of stuff. So these days, we do an awful, awful lot less of this, okay? So a uh, nice little quote here from Martin Thompson. And uh, basically, the, the idea is that um, if you're working in things like games, complex user interfaces, all that kind of thing, well, you're not afraid of complexity and you have to think about things at a slightly lower level of detail, you know, where uh, the, the web has perhaps been overly kind to us. You know, we've all got a, obsessed with document interchange and sending JSON up and down and that's it. So uh, one thing I always encourage new developers to do these days is take what I call the Bruce Wayne approach. You know, so whenever Bruce Wayne goes out to learn how to be Batman, he travels the world and he's not interested in learning about the, the newest flashy things in uh, sports or martial arts or criminology or whatever he's studying. He goes back to the old masters. He goes back to the, the root styles. You know? So uh, if Bruce Wayne was going out and learning how to program, well, he'd learn from the world's best small talk developer. He'd go out and find the world's 
best Lisp developers and Haskell developers and so on. Because at the end of the day, there are only so many kinds of programming. And you can see them there on the slide. And uh, once you've mastered these kinds of programming, well, then there'll be nothing new or scary or maybe even interesting in the, the latest flashy programming language. You know, So uh, it's a good idea maybe to go out and take the, uh, the Bruce Wayne approach to learning about things. And uh, these days, there are a shed load of different resources out there. Uh, these are some of the books from my shelf of shame. Uh, at home, I have a shelf of technical books that I empty at about half the rate I'm adding to it. So that's why I refer to it as my shelf of shame. Uh, but uh, these are the things I'm chewing my way through at the moment. Uh, these are some old, absolutely classic books that I would recommend to everybody, you know, uh, especially Implementation Patterns by Kent Beck, which is absolutely brilliant. You know? And you sort of notice about those recommendations, they're not about the hot technology at the time nope. they're they're timeless concepts and yes. these are the, these are the books that we sort of continue to recommend even today yeah absolutely so some of these books were written 20 30 years ago and they're, they're just just as relevant today as they were back then so great quote from our friend mark allen uh, back in the days when programmers were women and hardware was expensive we could and he listed a whole pile of amazing things we were able to do back in the day with limited memory and cpu cycles but we couldn't fit it in the slide you know uh, if we were still coding with that care and ingenuity who knows what we could achieve at the very least we'd be making a sizable dent in the climate emergency you know we wouldn't be uh, heating up so many cpus so what are we saying? Well, focus not on the latest shiny language or library or whatever, focus on reusable skills. You know, think a little bit more about algorithms, data structures, writing clean code, design principles, all that kind of thing, you know? So try and cut down the amount of time you spend jumping around from shiny framework to shiny framework. Cool. Cool. Uh, so number eight here, uh, value the individual. Now, uh, in some ways, we've got a lot better at this uh, over time. We, we uh, you, you, work life balance is something that's usually pretty much at the forefront of developers, and we do have a, a, a good lifestyle. Um, you know, we get rewarded, especially in the current market with hiring and that. Um, but I think we've, we've lost something, I think, along the way. So at the start, Agile was all about professionals. It was all about, you know, doing a good job. It was trying to cut out waste so we could do a better job. It was not so that we could have an easier life. Uh, it was so that we could actually make better stuff and, and, and cut out waste. So it was about coming together and being self-organizing as a team and not following some blind sort of uh, uh, enterprise process, some checklist process that was just busy work. Um, there was some assumptions. It was assumed that you were technically competent, you had the skills to do the work, and um, but you also were a professional that you wanted to do that good job. That that drive was primary in your mind, and I think for most people that is. But there's something that I think there's something that's gone askew. Um, you know, there was, I th I think we because we're focusing on the group, um, we're not giving it the same amount of accountability to the individual. So this is a this is a really nice quote. Uh, the strength of the pack is in the wolf. And then the strength of the wolf is in the pack. So, you know, the group uh, is going to fail or succeed uh, as a group and we're going to support each other. But we also have to make sure that each individual within the group uh, is taking responsibility, being accountable and being a professional. So we just need to make sure that, um, you know, we're not developing methodologies which are discouraging this. So, for example, you know, something like Scrum, is it creating such a, uh, prescribed process that people can just well it's, I'm not accountable because I'm following the process you know or well it's not my fault because the, the group has failed it's not me we need to make sure that we are taking you know self accountability um, and we're showing dedication to projects and teams and we're not saying well it's okay in six months I'll just move job and you know and do things like that we have to be professionals and I, and I love this quote uh, from Jason here he's saying agility is when employees get to act like grown-ups you know uh, that uh, the employee is going to treat the business like it's their business and they're going to make mature responsible professional uh, decisions so what's the takeaways uh, take responsibility for your own work be accountable for your own work focus on your principles uh, over process Always keep asking, why am I doing this? Is this going to lead to better things for uh, my business, for my customers, for my team? Uh, and just all in all, be a professional. Yeah. Very good, excellent.
So I'll do uh, number nine. So uh, this, I have to say, didn't come out of discussions with the people we referenced earlier in the slide. Uh, this is a personal feeling of mine and also friends of mine in the industry, usually after we've had a few drinks, you know. And uh, it's just the feeling that just like the 90s, we're on a bubble which is slowly expanding, okay? So uh, if you talk to anybody who lived through the, the dot-com boom and then the dot-com bust, uh, they'll tell you how much fun it was, you know. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, the big mistake that was made uh, was to confuse potential with demand. In other words, everybody was saying, look, uh, you know, this stuff is currently being sold online, but there's all this other stuff. I mean, look at all of the other things that could be sold online. So yes, there was tremendous potential, but what happened was the market just kind of went, you know, the, the market reached a point at which they were bored of buying things online and they'd had quite enough of buying things online for the moment, thank you very much. Yeah, And uh, the bubble popped and uh, if you were graduating at that time, well, you were stacking shelves in Tesco's for four or five years, you know, uh, until you were able to find your first opportunity in the industry. So uh, that was the dot-com bubble and uh, as I say, if you didn't live through it, it was an experience. Yeah. So uh, again, this is not to blame developers today. If you are the fourth, fifth, sixth generation of students who's left college and uh, had a bunch of offers and got a job immediately and so on, well then it's natural to assume that this trend is just going to continue into the future. So um, here's a great quote from The Truman Show. We accept the reality of the world with which we are presented. Yeah? So if you've graduated in the past decade, well it's only natural that you would assume that the IT industry is going to go from strength to strength. But uh, if you look at some recent use cases, things like WeWork, um, there are signs that you know, the bubble has spread out and it might pop. You know, and we're all saying, oh, think of the things that could be done with Bitcoin or think of the things that could be done with machine learning or think of the things that you can't do in a mobile way these days and so on. And yes, once again, there's tremendous potential out there, but will there be the demand? You know, or will we just reach a point where we turn a corner and the demand hits a wall? So uh, you know, what would we say? Be prepared for the next downturn. You know? So a uh, nice little Riddick quote there, had to end sometime. You know? So uh, we've experienced 15 years of continuous growth. It can't go on forever. Okay? So build up your skill set, build up your resume, look beyond whatever current domain it is that you work in, uh, build up a network of contacts so that you've got a, a cushion uh, if and when things turn bad. Yeah. So uh, prepare for extreme, extreme change, you know, downturn in the industry, think about your career, educate yourself, make sure that you still have the kind of profile where you're going to be in demand. Cool. Yep. And uh, the last one then is remember what matters. So this one's a bit more uh, upbeat and less judgmental. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, always end on a high note. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, so life is short. You know, if you blink, it's going to be gone. Yeah. Think about what's important. You know, I guess just being a little bit older and having a bit of a longer career, um, you know, we sort of see time moving past us and gives us a little bit of a perspective. So just, you know, realize that time's going to pass quickly. Think about what's important. Try to enjoy uh, you know everything that's going on around you. Think about things outside of out, outside of your career, outside of your life. Um, yeah, because because life keeps on ticking. Uh, so this is a, a nice little uh, quote here. So fill your bowl to the brim, and it will spill. Keep sharpening your knife, and it will blunt. Chase after money and security, and your heart will never unclench. Care about people's approval, and you will be their prisoner. Do your work, then step back. The only path to serenity. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you very much. Hope you find that talk useful. So let me just summarize the uh, the, the ten lessons that we have. So. Uh, Number one, draw more pictures, okay? Do more diagramming and go and try and standardize the kind of diagrams that you use. Number two, don't just critique syntax, actually critique your design. You know, run other people's code, try and work out what they're doing wrong at the design level. Uh, learn to be more of a technical author, demand better documentation, try to write better documentation yourself, yeah? Invent a few more things locally, don't just jump for the nearest library, yeah? Learn to test in all its glory, you know, learn to understand all all the different testing quadrants. Master the tools that you have, all the little shortcuts and, way, and um, opportunities for automation and so on. Focus on the underlying fundamentals of our industry, you know, the timeless truths, uh, as well as appreciating that you're part of a group, you know, in an agile process. Also focus on your own individual skills, individual responsibility, accountability, making your contribution. 
feel the fear. Remember that we've had 15 years of continuous growth, but it can't go on forever. Uh, and finally, remember what matters. You know, for example, I think I was so busy I missed out the 2000s. You know. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so uh, you know, remember at the end of the day, it's just a job. Okay. So having said that, as uh, two uh, developers born in the 90s, I think at this week stage we want to say, go away and get off my lawn, you get damn out. kids. Get yes. damn kids, get off our lawn. Yes, off you go. Yeah.